or that's not doing it. All right. So let's do this. Um, Annie, if you'll switch to the desk view, please. A couple things real quick. Um, I'm part of a group called the Fine Art Collective North America. That's what this uh, tag is here for Instagram. This is a great source you might want to check out um, if you enjoy having demos like this. I know Above Ground has many, I'm sure, that are wonderful. This is just another opportunity to get more art materials information. Um, so that's a site to check out. If you'd like to follow my personal art journey, I'm at Marla Morrison Art, and I'd love to connect with you there and follow what you're doing as well. And then the brand that we're using is at Windsor and Newton. This is the Instagram site for that as well. So you can see new artists who are working with Windsor and Newton materials. From time to time, they'll post giveaways and it's just a good site to follow. Of course, I would suggest you go to Above Ground for all of your purchasing needs. But if you have questions about our materials that are very specific, be sure you keep our website in mind. It's windsornewton.com, no and in it. Um, I still go there frequently if I have questions or if I want to know, hey, is this color available? I check it out on our website and then I purchase from my um, local retailer just because we, uh, you're going to see full real retail prices at Windsor Newton. Um, so anyways, those are some sites to keep in mind. Oh, and I was going to mention on this uh, Fine Art Collective North America TFAC NA site, I'm going to be doing a demo next week on September 12th using a liquid light gel um, with a professional oil color doing some still life work. So this is a sample from that. So I'd love to see you there. I think it's at 1 p.m. Eastern, but if you follow this, you'll see, see promos for it. Okay. So these were the two paintings that you saw as part of the um, kind of ad for the class. These were uh, from uh, a, a trip to uh, Arkansas from this, uh, last spring break. And it was just really beautiful sky. And I first did it actually in gouache, which is this top painting. And then I also um, worked with it in watercolor. And I just thought it was perfect for this particular class because I think it highlights, even though you if you have similar subject matter, they're gonna look quite different depending on the media that you choose. Now, I think most of us are familiar with watercolor, right? Because as kids, you get those little sets um, with the round little oval or the, the oval pans. And we're all used to diving into watercolor because watercolor is uh, pretty user-friendly. It, um, it's fast drying and we, it's very transportable. I usually take a watercolor kit with me wherever I go and it has a lot of uh, benefits to it. I'm showing you this just to give an idea of the three primaries that we recommend for the Windsor Newton Professional Range, Windsor Blue Red Shade, Permanent Rose, and Windsor Lemon. Now, these are not the colors that I chose for our particular painting, but I did want to show you this just so you have it in kind of in your back pocket so you know that you can get a lot of colors from a small amount of paint depending on the ones you choose. Okay. So let me show you, let's squeeze out some watercolor. I've got this really nice little ceramic watercolor <clears throat> palette. I'm sure above ground has something similar. If you don't have that handy, also you can get um, kind of cheaper plastic ones that have a lot of wells as also. So um, for tube color, I find this very handy. The yellow that I picked for us to use is Windsor Lemon, <clears throat> excuse me. And on the front, you can see some information like it's super tiny print, I realize, but hopefully you can re read that it says series one. This just refers to the relative cost of the color. And so the series one is our most affordable color. And that typically has to do with the, the pigment that's used. OK, um, it doesn't mean that there's less pigment in it. It just means that the particular pigment used is not as costly to obtain and manufacture into color. On the back, I like to show this because I think the more you get into choosing colors, Honestly, I used to choose colors based on, ooh, do I like the name of this? Or is it cheap? You know, all these different reasons to pick color. But the more, um, I mean, I've been a painter for over, gosh, for most of my life, but professionally for 30 years. And so I've really gotten more into the habit of looking at the attributes of a color rather than the, the name itself. And so what this little square represents, if you can see that, you see how it's open with a slash, this tells you that it, this relates to its transparency. This is a semi-transparent um, pigment. Also, what Windsor Newton will do is on our tubes, we're going to tell you the pigment name. Again, super tiny, but hopefully you can see that it says pigment yellow 175. 
Now my eyesight is just borderline being able to read all this. So if you ever have any doubts on the color name or information, again, just go to our website and we're gonna give you all the technical details there. But the reason I find that valuable to understand what pigment's being used, so say this is called Windsor Lemon. <clears throat> And if you have another brand that you're working with, but you really want to switch to Windsor colors, but you're like, ah, they have a color called Sunny Yellow. Windsor doesn't have Sunny Yellow. Well, if you can find the pigment of Sunny Yellow, maybe it's Pigment Yellow 175, you jump over to Windsor Newton, you're like, oh man, they have a, a Pigment Yellow 175, but they just call it Windsor Lemon. So that's a way that you can match colors across brand, okay? So there's Windsor Lemon. And obviously with watercolor, um, when it comes to the components, you've got three main components. You've got the paint itself, and in the paint, you've got something called gum arabic, okay? This is what it looks like in liquid form, and then this is where gum arabic, its original kind of uh, the way it looks before it's processed. So these are gum arabic crystals. It's basically a type of tree sap, and this is something that watercolor and gouache have in common. It's sap from the acacia tree, which to this day, the best um, acacia sap or gum arabic comes from the Kordofan region of the Sudan. And so this is the only gum arabic that Windsor Newton will use in all of our watercolor series because it has excellent wetting properties and clarity compared to other gum arabics available. But you're basically relying on tree sap when it comes to watercolor, which I think is kind of romantic, you know, this tree sap in your painting. But if you want to add additional um, gum arabic to your color, one way you can do that, it, and we'll talk about this in more detail, but you can just add a few drops to your wash water. So we offer it this way as well. But when you squeeze out a tube of the um, Windsor lemon, like I've done here, you take your brush. Uh, I've got uh, our professional watercolor synthetic sable one stroke. This is the one I think believe I, uh, or this is a smaller size than what I suggested. It's a, a quarter inch, but I'm just grabbing it for, for showing you here. But the filaments look natural, but they're actually synthetic, uh, but they are really good at holding water. So I'm just gonna get it wet. And since this is tube watercolor, if you've not used it before, um, the reason tube color can be nice is if you're working large scale or if you plan on just using a small amount of color or if you're just painting and planning on sitting down and, and painting an entire piece in one session, uh, tube color is great because you can, it's very easily wettable and you can um, start painting quite quickly compared to pan color, which I definitely use but I just like to share uh, that tube color is excellent for um, painting over a large area and wetting uh, quickly. But I interrupted myself. So when we're talking about painting, you've got the components of the gum arabic, you've got the pigment, which is the color, and then water is the vehicle that drives the watercolor to the surface. So I had to get my brush wet in order to get water on it to drive the paint to the surface. Because no, you don't wanna take a big glob of watercolor and paint it, right? You need to dilute it with water. So that becomes the vehicle. But what's most important about watercolor painting is the paper itself. This is the binder for the color. It's not binder, like an oil painting, linseed oil is the binder. For watercolor, paper is actually the binder. This is what gives your watercolor painting permanence. So be aware that the paper you choose is very, very important, probably even more so than the color or the brush you choose, which I find a little shocking. But you have to think of it like kind of like building a house. You know, you want the foundation to be good because if you get the most expensive ex appliances and other things in your house, they're not going to be any good if the foundation crumbles on you, right? So that's why getting a good quality paper is quite important. Uh, the paper I recommended for the class is our professional watercolor paper. It's mold made, uh, which gives it added strength and durability. It is 100% acid free. And basically what that means is that it's just pH neutral. And so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, the paper itself yellowing or, or becoming degraded over time. It's gonna really hold on nicely to your paint um, and just be a very stable surface for the color itself. 
Um, sometimes people talk about archival. That's fine. There's just no strict standard on what makes something archival. But in the world of paper, that just means there's uh, no wood in it. So this is 100% cotton uh, rag that is mold made rather than um, uh, cylindrical press made, which is a different, <laughs> a different process that can get uh, uh, strange line work in the paper. I don't know if you've ever seen that when you've bought watercolor paper, but it can have kind of a grid-like effect, which can affect the look of your, your painting. All right, so the color, the other color I've squeezed out that we're going to use is our Windsor Red. Windsor Red, this is an older label, but it's a pigment red number 254. It's another single pigment color. And then last but not least, the blue we're going to use is Cerulean Blue Red Shade. And these are not the three primaries that Windsor recommends, but I chose them because and these are the ones I like to use in my own work because a lot of times with watercolor, I'm doing landscape work. And so I find cerulean blue to be really excellent for the sky. It's where the name cerulean is derived from. It's Latin for kind of blue green and probably even more uh, when I did a little more digging, the base in Latin actually refers to the word sky or heaven. So it's like a heavenly sky blue, which who wouldn't want to paint with a heavenly sky blue, right? <laughs> So cerulean blue is more of a, oh, and the pigment, let me share. The pigment is, um, oh my gosh, yeah, super tiny. Pigment blue number 35. It's another single pigment color. But uh, I'll wet some of this out for you. Let's see, you can see. If you haven't used it before, it's a very, um, more of a green cast. Uh, color. And these properties of pigments that we're talking about are going to be true for acrylic and watercolor as well. I'm sorry, acrylic and oil as well. But what's really cool in the world of watercolor is that you also get additional properties like granulation, which acrylic or oil painters don't get to have, quite frankly. So these two colors, uh, the Windsor Lemon and the Windsor Red are staining colors, whereas you can already see, oh, maybe, uh, definitely when it dries, that the cerulean is more of a granulating color. So this is something that makes watercolor and gouache different. Watercolors will granulate. With gouache, they don't do, they don't granulate. So, and you can see that more here in these two, right? This is the cerulean blue in the sky, definitely granulating, whereas I think this was an ultramarine. It's minimally, very minimally granulating, but nothing like you're going to see here. Okay. So am I missing any questions, Annie, or am I just going forward and just pop in and let me know if I'm missing anything. We're okay. good so far. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put this out here. These are the three colors in dry form, the cerulean blue, Windsor lemon, and Windsor red that we're going to use. And you can see the down, you know, you could consider it a downside, like the violet that I get from mixing these two. I really love it, but it's not going to be like the uh, high key violet that you see with the Windsor primaries here, right? But you as the artist, you choose, right? You choose what colors you want to use for your palette. And so that's why I've chosen Cerulean Blue. I like this particular kind of more muted violet for sky colors um, compared to that. So again, that's just personal choice, but all right. So let me go ahead and also introduce gouache. So I have this because I always think the word gouache is so funny. This is the actual word. Um, these are, there are two different ways to pronounce it, gouache, which I prefer, but you'll also hear, hear people saying gouache, which is also, you know, totally appropriate. It comes from the Italian meaning like uh, muddy or unclear. So, you know, it's not the most um, beautiful source, but it's referring to the natural opacity that um, gouache has. And it has opacity due to pigment volume. So this is the, the color I chose is the designer's gouache cad-free yellow pale. And we'll go ahead and squeeze some out here. I realize I should have been squeezing a little more color out. And something to mention too, designer's gouache only comes in tubes, whereas watercolor will come in tubes and pans. So it's, it has to do with the way gouache is formulated, I believe, that it's just not something that um, they've chosen or Winsor Newton has chosen to put in a pan, or maybe it's just, you know, chemically not advantageous to the color to, to make it in pan form. 
So uh, the CAD yellow pale or CAD free yellow pale, this is a proprietary um, pigment blend by Windsor Newton. I don't know how much you've uh, gotten into the concept of a cadmium free color. Those are for painters who choose not to use a heavy metal uh, cadmium any longer um, uh, for disposal concerns or health and safety concerns. The truth is the cadmiums that we use in the art materials industry are insoluble in the body. Like if you were to accidentally get it on your skin or ingest it, it passes through. You would never want to spray apply them, but the cadmiums we use, um, uh, you know, they don't lodge in your system like cadmiums from other industries. But anyways, all right, this color is called Permanent Rose. I really love Permanent Rose in both the gouache and the watercolor. Again, this is not the uh, primary set that Windsor Newton recommends for gouache. Let me show you, I should show you. It's very easy to remember for the gouache. Uh, what they suggest for the primary is primary red, primary yellow, and primary blue. Very easy to remember, right? And you get a beautiful range of color. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. When, in my little travel kit of gouache, I will often have these three with me, but I do also like to, um, and for this particular class, I wanted to use the permanent rose because I really like how uh, it's more of a slightly blue bias. And I felt like this with the ultramarine that I chose, this gives more of that kind of clean, bright violet that most of us think of with the violet. So I thought that was a nice contrast to the uh, cerulean blue uh, and Windsor red violet mix there. Okay, and here's the Cadfrey yellow pale. And then the last color I chose for my gouache uh, colors is the ultramarine. Um, I always say ultramarine blue. I notice here Windsor just calls it ultramarine, but um, this is a, a single, another single pigment color. And this is what you can see about all the gouache colors. They're going to have the black square, which tells you it's naturally opaque. Let me make sure I'm right on that. Yeah, they should all have that black square um, because that's kind of one of the beauty parts of a gouache compared to watercolor is that they're all about that luscious opacity. And because of the high pigment load, they have a very velvety matte sheen when dry. So let me go ahead and I'll brush this out quickly. So it's a different um, hue. But this breaking on the texture, this is what I actually, you know, this is, again, kind of highly personal preference. I, I kind of like how in gouache paintings, you'll get a breaking on the surface. Let me pull one of my gouache paintings out. This was one I did with gouache alone. And I tend to leave that kind of breaking up that gouache um, will do in a thicker layer. If you don't like that, you certainly just add a little more water. But to me, this is what one of the beauty parts of gouache is, is that it's that water media, but it can interact with the watercolor paper in a different um, way than, than the watercolor as well. But it, um, gouache has an opacity. It can also be layered quite successfully. So if I have this, when I let this dry, I could come back in and put an additional colors on it. If I have a darker value color, I can very easily put a lighter value color on top and it uh, that lighter value color will sit nicely on top. Whereas with watercolor, you're going to get that visual blending called glazing, okay? And that's, it's just two different techniques. Neither one is better or worse than the other. It's just uh, two different techniques, okay? But again, you can see that even in the wet state, this the richness and opacity is quite is a lot deeper than it is in watercolor and so you know I, I just think it's pretty easy to see there but let me know if, if it's if it's not um, showing up well to you and then for my blue I've got the ultramarine so I'm going to put that out and I'm using again I'm using some water you don't want to think of one it would just be not cost effective to think of it like acrylic. Like if I were to take a glob of this ultramarine, let me see if I can get you to see it. If I took a glob of this ultramarine and painted it out, one, I'd be wasting paint and money because that's just, that's not appropriate to get it in that thick of a layer. And two, one thing to be aware of with gouache, let me see if I can find it, is that gouache in a really thick layer can crack. So this is just a little sample of, you can get gouache thin and it looks more watercolor-like. To me, this is more of like an appropriate um, 
the thickness of gouache and then it progressively gets thicker. These are two, three, and four layers. And finally, I know this is gonna be really hard, but if you, if you have a thick glob of gouache and you bend the paper, you're going to get cracking in it. And I just think it's too, too dark for you to see it, but that thick texture will actually crack. So be sure that you dilute it a bit. Um, don't use it uh, extremely thick out of the, the tube, just dilute it a bit with water, okay? So I'll put this to the side and then we'll get painting here. I just wanted to show you the colors that we're gonna use. So we, I mentioned that paper is super important. I've got a watercolor block here. It's the Windsor Newton Professional Watercolor uh, 140 pound cold press. Cold press is kind of that, uh, I think of it, it's like the, the uh, Three Little Bears. It's not too rough, it's not too smooth. It's kind of right in the middle, right? Just right. Um, and so this is often my go-to for watercolor painting. This is the 10 by seven size, which I mentioned in the, in the notes before class. If you have all the, the colors, fantastic. Feel free to paint along. If you don't, feel free to you know get what you need and, and paint in the recording um, when you have the time. So I uh, believe, I could be wrong, but I believe I suggested the um, half inch professional watercolor synthetic sable. So I'm gonna use that to begin. Uh, what I'm working from here is a photo I took of downtown Dallas the other day. We were driving back from a like a day trip out of town. It was raining, and but there was some really beautiful light coming across the city as we were headed home and I just happened to snap a picture of it. And I thought this would be really nice to paint showing uh, watercolor, uh, how watercolor can shine along with gouache. So this is the image I'm gonna be working from. So I'll put that there. And I went ahead and made a little sketch here. Um, if you wanna quickly sketch it, feel free to do that. I take a lot of pauses to chat. So I don't think you'll be too left behind as we go. But um, in order to kind of tackle a piece like this, what I do is I will often kind of think of the largest area first. So I'm gonna soak my brush. I mentioned that it's synthetic. Um, it's like a synthetic, well, it's called synthetic sable. So it, all that means is that the filament is trained to hold water like a natural sable brush, but it's, um, a more durable brush because of its synthetic nature, but it's also a nice opportunity for artists who don't want to use natural hair to have something that's very, very close to a natural hair filament. And it holds water well, and it has, um, in, in the case of this uh, one stroke, you can get really crispy edges with it, or you can also do some detailed line work depending on how you hold the brush. So I'm going to get my cerulean here. And with gouache, I'm sorry, with a watercolor, you typically want to, this is, I typically think light to dark, right? So I'm going to do just a very, very light wash of my cerulean in the sky and just brush it out. You could wet the paper first if you want. Many times I don't do that. You do see that I have like a masking tape border. That's mainly just because I really love the effect of peeling your tape afterwards. Um, and you get that nice kind of crispy edge. If you want to add the hint of any lightness in the sky, you can certainly leave some breaks of white of, of the paper. Because even though we make, um, you know, Chinese white and a... Uh, in the gouache, we have a permanent white, which you can come back in and add white to your painting. To me, it's just not the same as leaving the white of the paper showing through, okay? So I am doing a lot of water, a little bit of color. I'm just trying to quickly block it in. I tend to do this, I try to use, just to kind of in, uh, encourage some looseness in the painting, I tend to use a brush that seems a little bit clunky for the size of the piece. So this is a fairly large brush, um, but I kind of like that because it keeps me from getting too mm, kind of tight with it or too controlled because I'm the kind of artist or kind of personality where I can get kind of perfectionistic and I don't really, that's not really my goal. I, I love paintings that I see that are loose and free. So I really try to embrace that in my own work. 
And I've just found that one way to kind of trick myself into doing that is to give myself a big brush, a bigger than it seems practical for the surface I'm working on, work kind of quickly and just try to not get too fussy with it. But of course, you know, depending on the type of artist you are, you can certainly do very beautiful detailed watercolor paintings that are very, you know, hyper realistic. I'm just expressing that that's not my particular goal when I sit down to paint. Okay, so quickly just that one layer of cerulean is going to come in and um, settle. You can already see how that cerulean is uh, granulating in the paper. Okay, which I find to be a really lovely effect. This is something I mentioned that this is something watercolor will do for you. That's not really the property of uh, gouache or definitely not oil or acrylic. So we've locked that in as that's drying, because I'm going to add more, of course, but as that's drying, I'm going to start working on the buildings. Now, one color that I mentioned that I need to bring out now for the watercolor is uh, burnt sienna. Uh, this is a, um, a uh, more transparent color. It is a single pigment and I'm just going to put it with my red on the palette there and just rinse my brush in my, and by the way, I just, hopefully you're okay with these kind of details. This is my well-used water container, but um, it has essentially two sides for watercolor either. I always think it's a good idea to have two containers, one for your first wash and one for your second rinse, just to keep your, so you don't have to constantly be changing your work water. But that's that's what I have going on there. So uh, just the double rinse with my brush. And I think what I'm going to do for most of these buildings is I'm going to take the burnt sienna. And I'm going to use that to kind of block in a lot of my at least the lower buildings here. Uh, and just kind of use that as a bit of a base color. Maybe not that more bluish one, but these down here, I'm going to uh, block in with the burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is a uh, very warm earth tone color. It is a staining color. And I usually like to have either burnt sienna or burnt umber in my palette because you can get really lovely blacks or just a really dark, dark value color with uh, ultramarine and burnt umber or is a different kind of neutral tone with ultramarine and sienna. So I typically always have one of those two handy with my um, ultramarine blue. Okay, so this is you know, I should know the names of all these buildings. I, it would probably come to me. I think this is the old courthouse building here. So just kind of, it feels a little clumsy. I'm not going to lie. It feels a little, uh, <laughs> a little clumsy as I'm kind of blocking it in. But again, I, I really like how that kind of forces me just to keep moving and not get too precious with it. And um, I like how it leaves uh, some variation in the line work. Um, but of course, you're going to find tips that help you in your own practice that that work for you. Um, but I find, you know, taking classes is just a chance to see how other artists approach um, approach things and take what works and drop what doesn't. But all right, okay, so I'm gonna block this in. And we'll go ahead and do this one here. And I guess we'll do this one here. Get a little bit of that sienna in. Okay, so then that's gonna dry. So now I'm going to pop back up to the sky here. Usually with the sky, I'm not trying to exactly copy it. I'm just referencing, you know, the concept of, okay, obviously this is the sky. So, oops. So yeah, this will happen too. I'll drip water on it. So with watercolor, of course, it's nice. If you get a little drop on there, you can just dab it off. Um, sometimes you do that purposely to help with actually cloud work or other things, but that was easy enough to take care of right there. And let's see. So I'm cleaning my brush. And I think what I'll do here, um, I want to do, I said I'm going to do the sky, but I 
forget that I'm going to come in and do these parts, this one with a super light, super, super light sienna, and then I'll go back to the clouds. So I don't know if that happens to you. You have something in mind and then you, uh, your brain says, wait, go back. You missed something. <laughs> so I want a very razor, razor thin layer of sienna here and here because I think we're going to really make that pop with the gouache and give it that gold, that golden sunlight effect. But I want a very light sienna in the back. So a couple of the buildings over here, what I want to do is I'm actually going to put Cerulean as my base under, and then we'll layer on top. So with this building, I'm going to put Cerulean and this one too. And on the shadow side here, I'll do that. Okay. All right, everyone good so far? Hanging in there? Could probably get a little closer at this point if you want to see more going on. Sometimes my phone pops back up, so apologize for that. Okay, so I said I'd go back to the sky. Let's do this. I'm going to take the cerulean, but in order to get this more violet tone, I'm going to add some of my Windsor red to it. So I've got my wet brush and I'm going to dip it in the Windsor red and move it here. I'm going to move this. I think that's making a little shadow on it. There we go. That's my hand. Maybe if I move this out of the way. How about I'll just lift it up so you can see it better. So I've got my cerulean and I'm just adding some of the Windsor red. And so this is a chance to mention, this is just one way to approach working with watercolor and gouache. Of course, you can do gouache paintings on their own. You can obviously do watercolor paintings on their own. And I, and I work fairly slow with this. I wanna really make sure I'm getting the color that I, that I want. Um, but in, like for this particular piece, I, I plan on doing a lot of the building up with watercolor and then finishing out with some gouache on top of it. They're fully compatible. I don't know if I said this already, but a colleague of mine calls gouache and watercolor um, cousins, and I think that fits. I like it. So I start using it. I may or may not always give them credit for that, but <laughs> it's like they're cousins. They, they work well together. They're both water media. Um, and you can see here as I'm working, I just, I turn my brush different ways. Again, trying to encourage that looseness and freedom that you see in, in the sky without trying to exactly mimic these, these exact clouds. I just want to, you know, I think our brains read that, oh yeah, this is the sky. These marks are certainly clouds. So I'm just kind of pouncing them in a bit here, do a little bit there. And this is a case too, what's great about water media, I'll just show you, I'm not sure that this is, you know, super important other than just to show you this concept, but I'm gonna take my rigger brush that I also mentioned to have handy. This is size two, same synthetic sable. Riggers are designed to be really great for um, ropey line work or in fine detail. And that just has to do with this really long brush head. When you, when you, um, when you brush it out, oh, that's not working well, but here, there's my little scrap. Here we go. When you brush it out, you can do really, really long, thin lines um, with, with, with ease, right? It's just very easy for detail work and, and it holds a lot of water. So I usually find it handy to have one, uh, like a large one stroke for that freedom and looseness and coverage, and then coming in with a, a rigger to do a few little detail points. So if you see this area here, this is kind of nitpicky, but I also wanted to show you one of the beauty parts of a water media. If I don't really like that kind of featheriness there, I can just load my brush with a bit of water Oh yeah, it had cerulean on it. That's okay. It has a little cerulean and water, but I can I can just use my brush to kind of massage and soft massage that color and soften it, soften the edge of it if I want. 
uh, you just kind of have to rub it a bit and it'll soften that kind of um, spikiness. So, you know, that's really up to you. Another way to do it is just to add more color and layer, but that's something you can certainly do. Or sometimes in worst case, maybe you, you, there's a blob of color that drops on there that you didn't want. You can certainly, the, the nice property of water media like wash and watercolors that you can take your brush and a little water and just gently scrub it and you can lift it. You can't lift it off of all papers. This is where the paper comes back into play. The Winsor Newton um, professional watercolor paper is internally and externally sized. And so what that means is it is much easier to lift from cheaper papers. Like say, for example, you're working on, you know, like a mixed media paper or a um, even just copy paper, which isn't sized at all. Um, you can't lift anything because it just soaks into the fibers and, and it stains the paper. But with a good quality watercolor, you can lift because of that sizing. And this is just called, um, if, I, if I were to dab on this, I'd be lifting the color. But I hope that makes sense. But internally and externally sized. If a paper is only externally sized, that means that you could lift once, but then as you scrub the color, you're lifting the sizing as well. And so that can be a problem because if you paint over it and you want to lift that, well, now you're down to raw paper again. But since we have internal sizing, that's not going to happen. Not so I hope that that offers some clarity there. Okay, so let's add a little bit more of our violet. Oh, let me go back to my larger brush. Do that. So my one stroke. And with watercolor, a nice way to proceed is you can, um, I, I often think of it as less is more, you know, don't get impatient, like, oh, I've got to, I've got to get all of this tackled right away. I mean, you can work quickly with watercolor, but just um, even working quickly, you want to have some patience with layering. So this is just called glazing, where I'm taking fresh color and layering it on top of the color underneath. And what that does, it's like stacking pieces of stained glass. You're looking through the two layers of color now and you're getting something entirely different than if I were to only mix it on a palette and apply it to the surface. Makes sense? Okay. So I'm just mixing a little bit more. And every time I mix, it's probably gonna change the mixture slightly. You know, one time my blue might be slightly more red one time it might be slightly more blue, but I just kind of let that happen. I don't, again, I'm not wanting to get too fussy with it. So like, for example, now I've made this violet a little bit more of a red violet because I want it to have a slightly deeper tone at the top of the painting. Okay, and maybe I want a little hint of a cloud right there just because I do. Okay, and then if you notice down here, the um, in the photo, there's more warmth coming up. So we can certainly suggest that um, with a more just Windsor Red now. So I'll clean my brush a bit and I'm just gonna take, my Windsor Red is sullied up with my Cerulean Blue, which is fine because I just want to, you know what, actually I wanna add a little uh, yellow. It needs, I want it a little more orangish. So you can see I have the Windsor Red with a little Cerulean, put it with my yellow, and now I've got kind of a brownish color, but I think here it's going to be a good um, underlaying color for, for uh, that warmth, kind of greenish, but I'm going to cover over it with some of the gouache, okay? All right. Okay, so now let's go back to our buildings. We'll let the sky sit for a second and we'll go back to the buildings. So I wanna deepen the intensity of some of the patches down here. So this is where I'm going to take the um, burnt sienna. I'm gonna take some up there. And in order to get some depth, I'm actually now gonna jump to my ultramarine gouache. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the tip of this larger brush, taking a dab of the um, a dab of the sienna, and a dab of the ultramarine gouache. 
because that's the other thing to say too because these are cousins they're fully intermixable you don't you can layer them and you can physically mix them of course the transparency will be somewhere in between watercolor and gouache now because i'm mixing them but i'm fine with that because remember from this little from this little piece if you use gouache thinly it looks very much like watercolor anyway so I've mixed these two, the ultramarine gouache and the burnt sienna, and I'm gonna add some depth to the um, buildings now. And I'm really using the brush to its advantage, just using, you know, turning it to get those, um, to get that crispy edge at the top. And if I want it here to create a shadow, I do that. So I'm just kind of turning the brush as needed. Okay. And I'll just come over the sienna. So depending on the color underneath, that's going to subtly affect the overall look since it's, again, it's glazing here. So just keep going across and getting this darker value. And You can see how the painting really starts to build and starts to be a little more recognizable. And here, I'm actually going to leave this because I think I'm going to come back with um, a fine with my rigor and do the little windows there. But um, so I'm going to leave that one. And I'm going to add a little bit of depth under this um, tower here. And just keep going underneath. Okay. Oh, and I want to get this here. And if it's just not the right shape, I just turn my brush to get it a little bit better. And of course, if I really want to pop the detail a little bit, I can do that with my fine brush in a second. Okay. So let's now I'm going to work on this building because I, I see these two buildings as kind of my comp, you know, this is the star of the show, this, the color hitting the tall building, but I see these two buildings as kind of interacting more directly with each other. So I'm going to use a little bit different um, color mix for that. So I'm going to come to my ultramarine. I'm going to bring it to the center where I already have the, um, that brown mix. Because this is something to mention. Since I was mixing Sienna and Ultramarine, this is like an orangish, orangish brown with blue. Orange and blue are complements on the color wheel. So when you mix them together, you're going to get a toned down, darker value color. Um, and so this is why, even though we do make, you know, ivory black and I think one other black, which you can certainly have and use. I tend to prefer mixing my own blacks or darks because you can really get um, a lot of lovely undertones when you do that. Um, so that's just, and then you just have less colors on hand. So if you if you think about color mixing and how to um, mix two colors to get something totally different, it's a way to have less colors on hand but to really uh, boost your 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 choices when it comes to painting. Okay, so these are starting to stand out from the rest of the crowd here. Maybe I'll put just a little of a line there. Okay. Now, as this dries, I might come back to the sky and see if there's any more touch up I want to do. I think I'm going to move to my rigor now. My little brush hand fell over right there. Still okay on questions? I don't want to just be talking your ear off, but if y'all are enjoying listening and painting, that's good with me too. So, all right. So I'm going to get my Windsor Red and mix up some more of that really uh, soft muted violet that I really like uh, with the with the cerulean and the Windsor red. I just like it's kind of this nondescript violet, maybe like a 
brownie plum color. It's like a friend of mine was talking about painting her house and she was looking for a grayish, right? <laughs> Gray beige. It's kind of a nice uh, nondescript color story there. Okay, so this is a case where I absolutely don't like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dab it off. I mean, look at that. So easy, easy to make corrections. And what I want to do instead is I actually want to lift some of this color. So I'm going to just take my brush and soften that mark. And I'm going to take a paper towel and dab it. So don't be afraid to do that. Good quality paper allows you to make those changes as you need. And what I really want to do is I want it to be a little bit more blue. So I'm just adding some of that cerulean. And now I'll come in with a little bit here and a little bit more down here. Because I'm trying to use the clouds. I mean, definitely when we highlight the the building, that's going to draw attention to it. But I'm trying to use the depth of the depth of the clouds behind the building to also make it pop. So you can see how that's kind of helping bring it, making it stand out a bit. Okay. Something I I constantly think about with watercolor is I just just don't want to get too fussy with it. I don't always succeed. But I find that stopping, letting sections dry, taking an overall look at it before you proceed is, is a good way to kind of give your eyes breathing space, if that makes sense. So you can really look and see, you know, am I getting too precious or um, is it coming together like I want? Okay. So I just kind of fussed with that a bit. I'm going to leave that, I think. So I think now let's get more into the gouache part of things. So we added this dark tone, but I think I wanna make it a little bit deeper, a little more defined. So in order to do that, we're going to go back and mix more of it, this, but uh, that brown tone, but I'm gonna use, I'm gonna make sure I make it a little less water rich. So I am, just, you know, one dab sienna, one tab blue, going back and forth. And the other thing I will do too, if I look at it and I'm like, well, it doesn't matter that I keep going back and forth. It's still not the tone I want. I'm like, well, is there a different color I could add to adjust it? Like if I felt like this mix was slightly too violet, I could add a little tiny bit of yellow because what's the complement for violet? It's yellow. So theoretically that will cancel that. And then if I think, well, shoot, that's too much yellow. Then I just, you know, cause I don't want it too green. Then I just come back with the original mix. But, you know, this is just something that I found gives uh, more of a history to the color. It's very different than just painting directly out of the tube all the time. It adds, um, more character, if that makes sense. Because this is a, I don't know, I just see it as a richer grayish color than it would be if I bought a gray that looked like that, okay? So this is definitely a different cooler tone than the brown that's already on here. So I think by layering it, that's gonna be fairly nice and get a little more of that depth and darkness that I want in the front. Yeah, so that's looking pretty good there. So I'm just gonna proceed across with some of this. I'm gonna, you know, vary the edge a little because I don't really know what that is. I don't know if it's a shadow of a shrub or whatnot, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just kind of looking at the shapes, but they aren't super perfectly linear. Yeah, just kind of keep working across here. Just very, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is, just kind of touching on the surface just to add some of that deeper tone. So as we're doing this, this play of back and forth, I just find that this is what can be so pleasing about watercolor. You can work quickly. 
Um, you can adjust it very pretty darn easily. as you go and it can be a really um, painterly effect if that's what you choose. All right, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna go to the rigger. Let's go ahead and I like these little windows in the corner. So I'm gonna take my um, rigger brush and I'm just gonna suggest, I'm not gonna count them out. I'm just gonna suggest these uh, repetitive rectangular windows. I like that kind of um, repetition. And of course, I could get it more exacting if I wanted, but as we can see, I'm trying to go for more looseness here. So just dabbing and moving on, just eyeballing these uh, window shapes. Okay. And then we'll do the opposite with these windows here because I like this interplay of these windows versus uh, these on the on the photo. Okay, so then let's do this also. I want to hint at this turning the corner or you know around the corner of the building. So I'm just I'm going to take my rigger brush again and I'm going to just um, use it to its advantage. It's just if my hand can be still enough. I'm too much caffeine. <laughs> But if I can just kind of draw or paint this shadow line here and a little shadow on the top. And I want some shadow here. And so that's what I'm doing. I just look at the painting or the, the source image. Uh, if I'm indoors, I, at a, I'm looking at a photo. If I'm outdoors, I'm looking at the my surroundings. Because that's a beauty part of working with um, watercolor and gouache is you can they're very transportable take them anywhere and um, it doesn't take a lot of setup oh let me let me pause and show you so when i'm working let me set to the side for a second i have a really um i really like this little wrap i got from an artist on etsy but i'll take this with me so i'll have a, a couple of pens different brushes and this is my set that I usually will use um, when I'm working on the road. These are the pan colors that I was talking about. We get used to them as kids, but, and I think a lot of us get rid of them thinking, well, kids use this. But in all honesty, when I'm working with watercolor, I tend to use pans more readily because I'm on the road, I'm working smaller scale. These are perfect just to have out on the, you know, in the hotel or wherever and break out just a little container of water. Like I have this folding cup here that I use. Um, I've used a doggy dish before, which can also be handy, um, fairly inexpensive as well. And just have a water container and, and paint as needed. Um, tube colors are fantastic as well, but again, they tend to be um, really more useful for larger scale. I use it for demos though, because I'm working in one setting and I think it, you know, when you're only buying specific colors, it's much more uh, easy to just buy individual two colors rather than to buy a set and then replace the colors. So all that to say, um, but I just wanted to show my travel kit, whatever colors I use, I'll make a little color chart. So I have it handy. So I know exactly what I'm working with, but yeah, that's kind of my, my go kit for, um, traveling with watercolor. Okay, so that gave it a chance to dry a little bit. So let's look back here. And I think what we'll do now is we're going to start working on the warmth of this section. And I'm going to go back to my larger uh, brush. And we're going to mix with the The cad yellow pale, which is already, as you can see here, the cad yellow, cad free yellow pale is already leaning towards orange. So it's really going to make, especially when I mix it with a permanent rose, it's going to really make those, um, those gold tones quite readily or quite easily. So the cool thing about gouache is you, if you're used to acrylic or watercolor, to me, you can to think of it a little more like that because with watercolor you really need to work light to dark but with gouache you can layer as needed so i could actually start with this lighter value yellow and then 
or I could start with a darker value color and put the yellow on top. So I think I'll do that just to kind of highlight that gouache because of its opacity, you can layer it on top of other colors, even if it's a lighter value color. So um, let me go back to this a warm tone, that a warm neutral tone up here. I'm going to water it down a bit and we'll just um, lock it in a bit here. Have it cascade down slightly. I'm going to add it here too. I want to soften that a bit. Okay. And then, you know, I want to um, get rid of some of the, uh, I don't want it to be quite so warm tone here. So I'm going to do a very thin glaze of my neutral on top of this. Let me do that there and a little bit more here and a little over that blue okay and rinse my brush and then now i'm going to mix the permanent rose the permanent rose with the ad free yellow pale and you can already see that opacity right it's it's very very um rich brilliant color even though i love that color i want to keep it a little more naturalistic so in order to just take that down a notch i'm just going to take the tiniest bit of that ultramarine and mix it in just to soften the intensity and that's another tip too um, even though I want it to definitely look like orange, but I don't want it to be so screaming orange. In this case, I'm just taking the complement, which is blue, and adding it to, um, to mute it a bit. And so this is obviously still going to be more loud than it is in the photo, but it's okay. I'm going to add some yellow to that. Because in a painting like this, I'm trying to kind of highlight certain things. I often think of paintings as conversations, like you'll start it and then you have an idea. And then at least for me, I find it, it will go where it wants to go, regardless of the idea I might have had for it. Right. So I really try to embrace that. It doesn't always come out maybe in a way that I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I wanted, but at least I enjoy that process of action and reaction, right? So even though I realize these, these colors are quite different, I like how this particular color is relating with the others on the page. So um, I'm gonna leave that. And then I'm gonna to, I'm going to now take some of this yellow. I wanna move it over to a different spot of the palette. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit of that softened or more muted orange. And I'm going to now place that on top. And you can see how that is really starting to highlight that golden reflection of the sun at that time of day. And then I can layer more of the cad yellow pale on top to lighten it a bit. Okay. All right. And I'm gonna clean my brush. I want to let that dry for just a second. So let's work on a different part. Let's go over here to the other kind of player in this composition. And I'm going to pick up the ultramarine. It act, actually, I, I like that there's a little bit of orange there because I want to soften. I'm going to take some of this orange I mixed up and I want to soften the intensity of the ultramarine as well, give it a little more muted richness and so i like that mix there 
And so now I'm going to suggest this kind of angular shape on the building. And I got a little overzealous there. That's okay. I'm going to dab it just slightly. Marla, we have a couple of yeah. questions. Okay. Yeah. Ask away. I think you touched on this, but Shelly was oh, wondering okay. about the benefits of mixing these products. Why not paint with just watercolor? Yeah. So that's a great question. What I would say the benefit is, is that especially in a second one, I'm going to show you what you can do with the, um, well, one, one thing is the opacity. And especially if you use like the designer's gouache permanent white, you can punch your water media painting to a different level than you could with watercolor alone. There are purists who would say, you know, and I'm certainly not that. I work with all sorts of media. I love mixed media applications. So I'm not saying that, you know, for watercolor competitions and stuff, I don't know how they feel about gouache, but as compatibility goes, they're fully compatible together. And I really like the interplay of the opacity of the gouache with the transparency of the watercolor. So, um, you know, you don't, add, you don't have to add gouache, but I think it can be a benefit if you're trying to highlight certain parts. And I don't mean like highlight, I mean, a spotlight is what I should say. Spotlight certain parts of the painting, make them stand out a bit more. Gouache will do that for you because it has that opacity. Um, and then also just by the fact that you have a color like a permanent white, which I can go ahead and put out here. Um, it is a single pigment, it's PW6, which I'm pretty sure is titanium white, um, but you can add that. And that way, if you feel like you need to, uh, it's, depending on the painting, if you need to bring out the white in any part of the painting, the gouache will do that for you. Or if you need to get a um, softer tint of any of the colors, you can add a bit of white to it and get a range of colors that you can't get with watercolor alone. Because with watercolor, you're counting on the white of the paper right for everything but with gouache if you use it with your watercolor you get a i just think of it as expanding your painting possibilities because you're just you're getting a whole nother level of color mixing opportunity um this is a here's an example of a a piece that i did it's mainly watercolor but in just if, if you really look and i i think just because i know i did it i mean you know i i don't know that you would notice it if you didn't work with gouache but this slight the soft velvety green was gouache and I just really wanted it to set off the warmth of the rocks but there was going to be no way I could get it at that point since I'd already gone a certain path with the um the earth tone of the rocks but adding that soft kind of sage green on top I think that was like the last thing I did and I really like how that interplayed with the piece um but then you can, and then like, that's this idea here. So this was a much looser example where in this case, um, I was using more gouache in the water and it's very, very soft and subtle, but compared to, uh, always have it stacked nicely and then I can never find it when it comes to it. But the, the painting at the very beginning, um, well, this is, well, this is gouache only, and that's just a certain kind of dominant, but yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not seeing it right this second, but the painting on the, on the, on the advertisement, which was, it's the scene in Arkansas with the, um, the sky that was all gouache and it just has a very different look. So I don't know if that answers your question, but to me, I just see it as it expands your possibilities, um, with painting, um, you could certainly do all watercolor, but you, you you don't have to. If you have a more specific question than that, I can help you, Shelly, but that's kind of how I would answer that. Um, where did I get the flowery travel case? I got it on Etsy and it's this artist, uh, Kay Christie, Fine Art Creations. And then can gouache also work on canvas as opposed to paper? You know, that's an excellent thought and it's not one that I have done, but I would say that if you're using unprimed canvas, I think it will work um, just coming from the um, tech part of things because 
Unprimed canvas is essentially fabric, which is semi-absorbent. The, the challenge would be, why would you want, or uh, let me ask you this, why would you want to use gouache instead of acrylic or oil on the canvas? Are you thinking you could get a different look to it? Because while I think you physically could do it, I'm not sure it would be cost effective based on the fact that since it's an unprimed canvas, so much of it would get soaked into the fabric. And it, to me, it just wouldn't be cost effective to do that. Um, and then, could you put watercolor glaze on top of the gouache? Uh, oh, uh, yes, you can. Let's see if I can, but I, you know, I don't know exactly what, let's try it. So. Let's take this little sample. Let's put, um, this is the dry uh, permanent rose. So I'm going to put a glaze of the uh, lemon yellow on top. So let's just see. There's no chemical or physical reason you can't do it. Um, yeah, it's just depending on the color, you may, you it may not show up. So let me try a different, let me try the uh, cerulean blue on top. So yeah, that's better. So yeah, you can get a neat glaze effect that way, um, you know, depending on the colors you use. So here's the blue on top of the yellow. So yeah, you can certainly do that. And that's really cool. Look at that, that granulating cerulean on top of that opaque yellow really pops that granulation. I know it's probably hard to see um, on the uh, screen, but that's that's really cool effect. So yeah, great question there. Um, yeah, Diane says she uses gouache white for small highlights on a watercolor. Yes, 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 yes. That is something to, goodness gracious. That is something that I definitely will do. And oh yeah, here's the painting I was talking about right there. This is all gouache. Um, oh my word. Well, I did a painting on black. That's the other cool thing about, oh yeah, yeah. So that's another cool thing about gouache that makes it a little different than watercolor. This is a black paper that I had and you can paint a gouache on it. Obviously, depending on the color, it's gonna be more or less dominant. But this was um, the ultramarine. This is ivory black I painted on top. And then this was the permanent white watered down. So it really gives you that kind of um, hazy sky effect. And then like Diane mentioned, I just use the rigor brush with tiny, tiny dots of the permanent white for the stars. Um, and, and yeah, so that's an easy thing, you know, like if you're unsure about gouache and you're mainly using watercolor, probably one of the coolest things you can do is just pick up a, a tube of the permanent white, have that with you and try incorporating that to see how it works for you. Because I think once you do that, then you'll get a small palette that you keep with you because you're, you're gonna end up liking how they interact. Like I had this out just to show, just to show um, these are the colors that I will stash with my watercolor bag. Sorry, let me. So it's the prime, um, wait, where's the primary yellow? Oh shoot, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I will stash the primary gouache colors. So primary yet red, yellow, and blue with the permanent white, the Windsor red, just for, this is my blue bias um, red. I like the Windsor red as the counterpoint. I love cobalt turquoise light. This is just a personal favorite color that if I'm doing beach scenes or whatnot, I really like to have. And then the burnt sienna or burnt umber, um, like I said, for mixing the dark. So this is something that now, I'll throw these seven colors in my uh, watercolor bag along with this travel kit. So I'm not the lightest traveler, but I still have it down to a bag. And for like airlines and whatnot, the the gouache, I have to say, would not be as easy to ca carry on. You probably have to check it, but I've never had to um, check my pan color. So that's another cool thing about uh, flying is that if you have a setup like this with just your brushes in a in a pan set, I've never had to check that. And um, then you've got your paints with you. So, yeah. So okay. And then what do you what is the main difference between ch Chinese white watercolor and gouache? Yeah. So that's a great question. And actually, in my little pan set, I used to keep a Chinese white with me. You know, um, it's it has to do with transparency. Uh, so here's. 
uh, all right, so here's the cobalt turquoise, turquoise light, French ultramarine, and watercolor. Same exact two colors and pigments in, in gouache, okay? You see the hues are similar, but it comes down to opacity, okay? And so same thing for Chinese white. Chinese white is a watercolor. So even though the pigments are opaque, there's just been no way I've found that you can bunch it up thick enough in the formulation to do the same thing that uh, permanent white will do in the gouache. Uh, it's just, um, so Chinese white as being a watercolor is much softer. It's a very, very soft tinting color. So you could use it with your watercolor to make a pastel tint of the, you know, any color that you want. But if you need like a really bright, vibrant highlight white, like you get making the stars here, Chinese white probably won't do that for you. You'd have to use like the permanent white. Okay, so I hope that helps with that question. Any others? I love it. Um, any others? Let me know. I just brush off this little edge here. Okay. And brush this off. So yeah, let me know if, if you need more detail on any of that. I'm going to go back to this and see if I can get it a little. I want to just get it a little more finished if possible. Unless Annie, you tell me I have to stop. <laughs> so I had a question. Yes. Yes, as a proponent of Windsor Newton, do you think that they um, they're not excelled when it comes uh, to developing and perfecting their product with uh, other players in the game, like Liquid Tech's dropping out some years back? <clears throat> so, so you're asking, say that again. You're asking about the quality of Windsor compared to other um, brands. Hey, Is that yeah. what you're moving ahead of uh, the pack, so to speak. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, what I have to let you know is that Windsor Newton and Liquitex are actually sister companies. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know if you're aware of that, but so a lot of the in-house services and chemists uh, involved in manufacturing the color are the same for the brands. Um, and so Liquitex and Windsor Newton are, are really not direct competitors. But if you're talking about Windsor Newton watercolor compared to other brands of watercolor. I mean, Windsor Newton is just known as kind of one of the standard um, yeah. bearers out there of quality color. A lot of it because of just the long, you know, history behind it. But I, me as an artist, I've been working as a um, an artist contractor with Windsor Newton for over 20 years now. And I've I've been very pleased with the company as a whole and how they are constantly trying to keep up with health and safety concerns and manufacturing, um, you know, issues that may come up. Um, for example, with the synthetics, they're doing things like making sure any wood handles are FSC certified, Forest Stewardship Council certified. So they're using, recycle, you know, woods that are much more easily replaceable um, and not uh, impactful to the environment in a negative way. So there, you know, I feel like as a, as a brand, it's a, it's a good uh, conscientious brand to, to work with. So, and I feel like the quality of the materials are <laughs> unsurpassed by any other brand. So Can I you know. use it for acrylics too? Um, the win. Okay. So Windsor Newton makes an acrylic, um, but honestly I do use Liquitex acrylics for Me my too, own yeah. work. And, and the main reason it's not a quality difference. Uh, I think the prof uh, the professional acrylic color for Windsor is good, but the main selling point of that is that it doesn't have color shift from wet to dry state, uh, whereas Liquitex does. But for me as an acrylic painter, that's never been an issue for me. Um, I like that the Liquitex range has so many mediums that you can use in the range because one of the beauty parts of working with acrylics for me is adding those mediums. Um, so. You know, again, that comes down to personal preference as an artist, but um, I find yeah. it darkens a bit to look with text acrylic once it dries. Darkens a bit. Yes. Interesting. Uh, I guess what I would like to do is if you want to share your work with me afterwards through Instagram, I could take a look at it. I also work on the tech line for, for all the brands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, you know, I get all sorts of questions that come up and usually I take artists through a step-by-step, -step, you know, does I need to, I'd have to ask you some detailed questions that, you know, may not be what we want to do in this session, but I'm happy to do it um, through Instagram if you want um, and just kind of talk through it because I, 
it shouldn't be darkening on you, right? You shouldn't, that's not something that you want to see <laughs> unless you're planning on that happening. <laughs> so I'd be happy to help you um, independently on that if you'd like. So Madeline had a question. Okay. Uh, when you take out watercolor or gouache out of the tube on your pan or porcelain mm -hmm. palette, do you, and it dries, do you revive it with water? Ah, so yeah. So this is the thing that um, Windsor Newton recommends with any type of tube color. And I know that artists do this where they will, you know, have their own pans or uh, that they squeeze out tube color into a pan and then they let it dry and save it and re-wet it. Physically, you can do that, but I, I advise artists not to for a couple of reasons. One, your brushes, if you're getting good quality brushes, they you're really going to start to abuse them by re-wetting dry tube color because dry tube color is chemically different than dry pan color. Pan color is formulated to uh, be much more re-wettable than dry tube color. It's a, I'm not a chemist, so, and, and a lot of it's proprietary, so they don't give me the, all the details on it, but if you when if you compare a pan rewetting a pan versus rewetting dry tube color you will definitely see a difference in ease of use so what i would say is yeah what i do here for demos i tend to squeeze out more than i need just to make sure i'm not constantly having to reload during a demo but um, what i try to do when i'm using tube color is only squeeze out what i need in a session and then i don't um, you know i'll use the excess on a scrap piece of paper, I don't try and save it. It's too hard on my brushes and some of the brilliance of color is lost um, as it sits because I don't know if it's the glycerin evacuating or what it is, but the color use, loses some brilliance when you let it sit out and um, re-wet it if it's tube color. So I know artists do it. It's just something that I think you're going to find that you're going to be happier with the, the longevity of your brushes and the vibrance of your color if you if you just invest in a little set of pan colors to use along with your tube colors if that makes sense and diane had a question she uses turner acryl gouache and okay. was wondering if she could mix it with windsor newton designer's gouache yeah, so I don't know. I haven't used Turner's gouache to, you know, tell you from my own direct experience, but just from what I know about gouache compared to like acrylic or oil, um, you know, I don't see any major red flag with that. I will tell you that any company is typically going to tell you that it's best to stick with one brand per painting because if there's ever any, um, you know, if ever anything happens with the painting where it's compromised, they're never going to know if it had to do with their paint or a combo of their paint with another brand, if that makes sense. So be aware of that. But me as an artist, I, I, this is just me talking, not Windsor Newton talking. I don't see a problem with that. Um, just because what I know about gouache, it, uh, what, like, for example, using water mixable oil, I would definitely stick with the same brand because water mixable oils are so new in the art scene relative to other media that different companies use different ways of making their oil water soluble. So you don't want to be mixing brands with that. But with a uh, gouache, uh, you're probably, probably okay. Hope that makes sense. So what I'm doing here, you can see that I'm able to layer this light value yellow. I used the permanent white and added it to the yellow. So I'm able to layer it to really start to suggest this um, pop of gold. And this is where I mentioned I like the breaking. This is another kind of gouache piece. I like, not kind of, it is a gouache piece, but I tend to like the breaking that you get with the paper and the gouache. You know, some artists don't, but I just kind of like that energy that the breaking of the of the paint gives. If you don't like that, you just add more water to it. Um, but and I feel like this is just still too vibrant. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to. I'm going that what's cool about it, you know, it's sitting here and it's dry, but it's not so dry that I that it's going to affect anything because we're still in the same painting session, right? So I'm just adding a little bit more blue to that so I can, um, yeah, there we go. I can make it a little, a little less 
um, of an electric orange. Tone it down a bit. And then I can come in and adjust that a bit as well. Okay. Now I want to adjust something over here real quickly. Any other questions? I don't want to, I know we're coming to the end of our time here. Always am ambitious. I think I'm going to have a ton of time to paint more, but um, hopefully this will get us at least to a point where you can see where you can go with watercolor and uh, gouache together. Like what I'm going to do in just a second, if this is getting more dry, I'm going to now take, I'm going to wet my brush a bit more and go back to that light kind of lemon yellow permanent white mix. And now I'm going to add this washi layer on top. And so you can see how that unifies it a bit better. So I just think of it as, you know, adding more layers, softening, more layers, softening, and so on. So and I want this to be a little more. So what I can do now, if this is a little too um, unresolved, this is where your rigor can come in and you can really start to punch a few bits of line work if you want it to come and focus a little in certain areas. So that's kind of how I'll end up here. Since we already have this mix, I'm gonna to go to this darker value. Well, I say that, I'm gonna to go to this darker value. I'm gonna add some of the ultramarine gouache and the permanent rose. So it's gonna be more violet. And in order to counteract that violet, I'm going to have this burnt sienna watercolor. See, see, you can see here, I'm just kind of happily mixing them all together. Again, they're cousins. They're, they're all in the same family. You can do that without any concern of um, compromising the integri integrity of the painting in the long run. Um, uh, so let me add a little more of this ultramarine. Okay, so now I've got kind of a red violet deeper tone and I wanna come in and I wanna add just a few little suggestions of some, some detail. Let me refine this a bit more. A little on the edge here. Of course you don't have to do it this way. I'm just trying to so just a little bit of fine detail to um, give something for the eye to rest on that's a little more detailed than than just the the color passages. So here I said I wanted to do so maybe what I'll do for this one I'll just very softly do some suggestion of the window this way. So that adds a little more interest to that particular building, a little more detail. You can suggest some of that here, and maybe a little bit there. Maybe just a tiny bit back here. That's what I like about the rigor. You can get some really fine detail with these quick strokes. But you know, that's the idea. I'm sure I'm gonna mess with this more just to kind of get, get more layers going, but Hopefully you can see, you know, how uh, watercolor and wash can work nicely on the same piece. Um, if you want to see what it looks like when complete, I will, I, I always post stuff to my channel afterwards, just so you artists can see kind of how I finished it out, how I resolved it. But, um, and if you want to switch me back to the, my face view, <laughs> so I can say goodbye. Did anyone paint with me already? If you did, it would be great to see it. Um, if you didn't, that's no no issue. But if you did paint with me and you don't want to show it now, please post it and tag me. I love to see what um, artists do in class or afterwards. That's always fun. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me at that at Marla Morrison Art. I'm happy to um, connect with you there. And I'm sure if you have other questions about We actually already have questions here in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. Caro asked, uh, can you dilute gouache so it becomes transparent like watercolor? Yes, you can. And that's, you certainly can. Um, I had that little sample with the blue stripes. If you do it in just a thin layer, it will definitely look like watercolor. So 
So I'll just show you here. We'll take the um, permanent rose and I'll add a whole, this is a permanent rose gouache. But if I add enough water to it, you can see how you couldn't, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to know that wasn't a watercolor, right? Because you just add more water to it. So gouache can be very watercolor like, um, but it, but you can't make watercolor as opaque as gouache. So that's kind of an interesting thing. That um, so that kind of means that gouache could be more is more versatile than watercolor. Yet at the same time, gouache only comes in tubes, whereas the watercolor also comes in pans, which to me is quite versatile. So, you know, <laughs> that's why it can be nice to have some of each in your go bag or at your studio so you can use them together. Now, somewhat, Diane says it says on the label that it's a polymer, maybe don't mix. I'd be curious what she's um, referring to there. Are you saying it the was the acrylic uh, gouache? Oh, acrylic gouache. Yeah, yeah. So acrylic gouache is a whole different animal. Um, so is that what she was asking earlier? Um, yeah, I assume she was talking about the designer's gouache. Acrylic gouache, yeah, is acrylic polymer. And it's trained to look like a, a you know, a, a watercolor gouache. So yeah, yeah. And then the other, um, uh, what, what kind of fixative do you suggest for mixed media work? So yes, um, Winsor Newton makes a brush on fixative. In all honesty, as an artist, I have not fixed my own watercolor. Uh, I just don't do it. Um, I, for ones I sell, I just recommend framing behind glass. Um, but if, but Winsor Newton does make a brush on fixative and um, that all you do, it's just called watercolor fixative, I'm pretty sure. And what you do is you decant it in a container and use a brush that you save only for um, using fixative. Don't use a brush that you use color because you can get color into your fixative layer then. But you just gently brush it on with a very soft synthetic filament brush. You kind of have to work very carefully so you don't disturb, disturb the surface underneath. Uh, but uh, you can certainly use that fixative. Um, older tube, can you use dry paint? So it's the same thing with, you know, the concept of taking tube color, letting it dry and re-wetting it. Physically, you can do it, but know that you're losing some color brilliance and you're also hard on your more expensive brushes. So maybe use cheaper brushes if you're going to do that so you don't wear down your quality brushes. Thank you. Oh, you're, thank you all so much for your kind comments. And I love your questions. And if you have more, feel free to reach out. Um, but thanks to Above Ground for hosting this. And Annie, thank you so much. And oh, if gum Arabic is in watercolor, what's the base for gouache? Yeah, so that it's the same. We use the gum Arabic for the um, watercolor for our gouache and for our um, student range watercolor called Cotman. So yeah, it's all the same gum cordovan, cordofan. It's a very specific a gum Arabic that Windsor Newton uses. So yeah, that's why they're fully compatible because really, they're cousins, they're the same water media animal, but um, yeah, they uh, you can use them chemically and physically together. It's not gonna hurt anything, so. All right, well, um, I think a lot of people are moving on and so I'm so glad it was helpful and thanks again and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.